When you drive around Wilton, what do you see? The community today certainly has all the appearances of a 21st century suburb. Main streets bustling with traffic as people head to work, errands, and school. Rolling hills dotted with shops, offices, houses, and parks. Many of the places around town, like the Comstock Community Center, the YMCA, or Wilton High School, are what you'd expect of a modern New England town of over 18,000 residents. What can be harder to find is the evidence of who helped build the town. Wilton didn't simply spring up fully formed overnight, and in many ways, it hardly resembles the community it was even 50 or 60 years ago. Evidence of its evolution from the forested river valley occupied by Native Americans to the cleared agricultural fields of the 18th and 19th century to the picturesque suburb we've come to know today can be hard to find if you don't know where to look. Some sites, like Ambler Farm and the Wilton Historical Society, are clear reminders of those who came before us. Street names like Raymond Lane, Belden Hill Road, or Hurlbut Street are slightly less obvious. Evidence of others who contributed to the development of Wilton are even harder to find, even if their stories date back to the earliest days of the English colonial parish of the early 1700s. These people were the enslaved Africans of Wilton, brought here to labor in the fields and homes of those whose family names now identify many of the roads we travel every day. Even after the end of slavery in Connecticut in 1848, descendants of these enslaved people called Wilton home. So who were these people who have come and gone? How did they contribute to making Wilton what it is today? And for whose benefit? What evidence do we have of the lives they lived? Through work done by researcher Dr. Julie Hughes, the Wilton Historical Society attempted to answer some of these questions. Through the examination of archival resources and the Wilton Historical Object Collection, a clearer picture of this community's history is created. I began looking for the history of Wilton's formerly enslaved persons in the Wilton History Room because that is our most dense and richest source of local history. The settlement of English colonists in Wilton began as early as 1706, with dozens of English families arriving soon after. These early farming families immediately began clearing forests and preparing land for their agricultural needs. Many of the names we associate with Colonial Wilton were among them. The Beldons and Gregories settled on what is today Belden Hill. The Lamberts built a homestead at what is today the intersection of Route 7 and Westport Road. The Betts and Raymonds established farms slightly north of that, and the Sturgises and the Olmsted claimed high land on either side of the Norwalk River. Wilton was quickly dotted by farms and homes from Norwalk to Ridgefield. 18th century farming in New England was labor intensive and required significant manual labor. A common practice throughout 17th century America was to enslave Native Americans. But by this point in Connecticut, much of their population had either been killed off through disease and war, or had moved west, away from colonial settlements. Some colonists instead sought another cheap labor source, enslaved Africans. The transatlantic slave trade started as early as the 16th century. And by the time the English settlers first arrived in Wilton, Slavery was prevalent throughout the colonies. Enslaved Africans were brought in by several of the early families of Wilton. Purchasing an enslaved person was expensive for the average farmer, and as a result, it was limited to mostly the wealthier residents. The research conducted to date by Dr. Hughes brought to light evidence of 133 enslaved people in Wilton between 1713 and the 1840s, who worked for some families recognizable to Wiltonians today. One of Wilton's wealthiest and most influential early families was the Lamberts. David Lambert first settled in Wilton in the early 1720s and owned a significant land holding near Westport Road, south of modern Wilton Center. His son, David II, was Wilton's first college graduate, receiving two degrees from Yale in the 1750s. David II married Susanna of the wealthy Fitch Rogers family, who were related to the former Connecticut governor, Thomas Fitch. David's sister-in-law, Esther, was married into a prosperous merchant family in New York City, who later built the Gracie Mansion. Despite his loyalist sympathies during the American Revolution, David II was a prominent member of the committee that proposed the separation of Wilton from Norwalk, ultimately leading to the founding of the independent town in 1802. He was later elected a Wilton selectman and helped found St. Matthew's Episcopal Church. The Lambert House is depicted on the Wilton Town Seal. David Lambert and his son David II owned at least four enslaved people named Jack, Coffee, Peg, and Charles D. King. And David II's in-laws owned at least one enslaved man named Michael. 
The document confirming the sale of Jack from Joshua Jennings of Fairfield to David in 1757 can be seen here. The Marvin family was one of the founding families of Norwalk in the mid-1600s, and their descendants were instrumental in founding Wilton as well. John Marvin Jr. was a signee alongside David Lambert of the 1726 petition which initially created Wilton Parish. John donated the land which would later become Wilton's second meeting house on Sharp Hill Road, and his relative Matthew Marvin was part of the committee that planned the construction of that building. Another Marvin descendant, Matthew Marvin V, operated a tavern out of his home on Danbury Road from 1762 to 1792, the longest operating tavern in town. This building can still be seen today in front of Wilton High School. Matthew Marvin V enslaved three people, Dick, Dorcas, and Phyllis. And Matthew VI also enslaved three people, Betty, Cato Green, and Harry Marvin. The Belden family first acquired land on the hill that now bears their name in the late 17th century, as well as property along Danbury Road near what is today Seely and Honey Hill Road. One of the Belden homes, Split Rock, can still be seen today at 539 Danbury Road at the base of Scribner Hill Road. The wealthy Belden family quickly became prominent members of the Wilton community. Captain Samuel Belden was selected a leader of the Wilton militia in the years before the American Revolution and owned and operated a large store on Danbury Road which supplied Wiltonians with many of the goods that helped grow the early parish. Samuel Belden was later the first town clerk and a co-founder of St. Matthew's Episcopal Church. Members of the Belden family enslaved at least 23 people throughout the 18th and 19th century. Captain Samuel Belden and his family alone enslaved 14 individuals, all members of the same family. Hagar Tonquin and her husband Bill Tonquin, who was Native American, their son Prince Tonquin and his wife Anna Smith Tonquin, and then their children, Catherine, Eunice, Grace, who was later sold to Hiram Betts and his family in 1824, Henry, John, Laura, Lucinda, Rhoda, Richard, Prince, and Nancy. The legacies and evidence of the families who benefited from enslaved labor in Wilton still stand prominently throughout the landscape. Josiah Raymond built the two Raymond Ambler houses on Hurlbut Street. The buildings are most likely familiar structures to all those who frequent Ambler Farm. Josiah enslaved eight people, Benjamin Curtis, Chloe, Chloe II, Ned, and four more unnamed people, one of whom was Benjamin Curtis's mother. John Cannon first settled in Wilton in 1790 and established a general store. The success of his descendants in that section of town later led it to be named Cannondale. John owned three enslaved people, Cato Cannon and an unnamed woman and boy. The list of those enslaved by prominent members of Wilton families goes on and on. Of course, there were residents of Wilton who fought back against slavery, both publicly and privately. William Wakeman established a stop on the Underground Railroad at his home on Seely Road, which included an underground tunnel which provided Wakeman a discreet way to move self-emancipating people in and out of the home on their way north to Canada and freedom. Those organizing the Underground Railroad did so at great personal peril due to federal laws enacting strict penalties for anyone harboring those labeled as fugitive slaves. Other residents were more vocal in their protest against slavery. The Georgetown Anti-Slavery Society was founded in 1838, led by members of the Georgetown Baptist Church, founded five years earlier. In 1838, the Society invited Reverend Nathaniel Culver of the Connecticut Anti-Slavery Society to speak. He lectured for three consecutive days in November after which a gunpowder bomb planted during the night heavily damaged the Baptist church building and prevented further meetings. Private homes of those who spoke out against slavery were also attacked. The home of David and Aaron Chichester, located at what is today Two Pimplewog Road, had two gunpowder bombs set off during an anti-slavery meeting. Luckily, no one was killed, and the Chichester property continued to serve as a stop on the Underground Railroad. With the outbreak of the Civil War in 1861, the nation would finally resolve the long debate over slavery. Well over 100 Wilton men joined the Union Army to fight against Southern pro-slavery secessionists, including a handful of African Americans. Among these were Henry and Samuel Dulliman, most likely the sons of the formerly enslaved John Dulliman. The brothers were born in Wilton and worked as general laborers in town once they reached adulthood. They joined the Union Army with the 29th Connecticut Colored Regiment in late 1863 and were sent to South Carolina. Tragically, both men died of disease while serving and were buried in South Carolina. Henry is honored with a headstone at St. Matthew Cemetery. Both men's widows, Anne Maria and Susan, 
left Walton shortly after their husband's deaths. With Connecticut finally completely abolishing slavery in 1848 and the 13th Amendment ending slavery throughout the nation, many now emancipated African Americans sought new lives. Some chose to stay in Wilton, like John Blackjack Tonquin, who worked as a laborer and farmer in town after achieving emancipation from the Beldons in the 1830s. He passed away in 1893 and is buried in St. Matthew Cemetery. In fact, many of those who stayed here are still here, buried in the section of St. Matthew's designated as colored. Others sought the promise of new lands to the West, such as Jane Manning James. Born in Wilton to the formerly enslaved Isaac Manning, Jane from a young age worked for the Fitch family in New Canaan. It was there she heard a Mormon preacher, Charles Wesley Wandell, and shortly after she was baptized into the Mormon church. In 1843, Jane and much of her extended family went west to the Mormon settlement of Nauvoo, Illinois, where she worked in the home of the founder of the Church of Latter-day Saints, Joseph Smith. She later was among the group of Mormons that traveled even further west under the leadership of Brigham Young to Utah, where she and her family purchased a home in Salt Lake City. Jane remained a prominent member of the Mormon community in Salt Lake City until her death in 1908. Unfortunately, all too often, the African Americans of Wilton and their families seem to simply fade out of the historical record. Dr. Julie Hughes was the driving force behind the research into these often forgotten lives and discovered how difficult it was to find extensive information on many of them. Dr. Hughes sat down here in the Wilton Historical Society interpretation of the Lambert family dining room as it would have likely appeared circa 1825. The objects in this room including the expensive portraits of David Rogers Lambert, Esther Lambert, Samuel Fitch Lambert, and Lorraine Lambert, are tangible reminders of the wealth slavery helped create. Under their painted gazes, Dr. Hughes described the strategies and difficulties in finding the hidden lies of those enslaved by the Lamberts and other families of Wilton. Dr. Hughes quickly found that not all sources were reliable or had extensive details on the lives of the enslaved people. For starters, Often you can find out that an enslaved person existed in the records. The land record sale might indicate that a transaction happened, or you might find in church records the, that a baptism occurred, but very often you don't even get a name. It'll simply say, you know, Ebenezer Bulkley's servant, and they'll use servant instead of slave, uh, that Ebenezer Bulkley's you know, servant was uh, baptized on that day. So just being able to identify that an enslaved person existed in a certain time and place in a certain household doesn't really get you to the point of being able to identify them in any meaningful way as a human being, as a person, much less as a personality. In particular, we've got the records of a late 19th century historian named David Herman Van Hooser and he left us extensive notes on his personal family history of keeping uh, people in slavery and of other Wilton families who had kept people in slavery. So he knew a lot, but I couldn't just trust what this late 19th century person had written because he's got a lot of hang-ups. He has a lot of things about slavery that he might want to prove or convince other people of in his time period, particularly that slavery in Wilton was maybe not such a bad thing. He wanted people to think that maybe it, it was a more innocent institution than it was. In many cases, given the frequently inexact nature of some 18th century records, even identifying someone of African descent could be difficult. But Dr. Hughes did find some clues that helped her find some of these long forgotten people. For people who were recently brought in from Africa, the names that they had sometimes reflected those African origins. So occasionally they would be named Cuffy or Cuff, which is uh, a version, an Americanized version of an African name. Sometimes they would be named Quash, that's another Americanized version of an African name. So when you see those names, generally you're looking at somebody who was actually brought in as part of the direct slave trade or somebody who is pretty close to those initial origins, who's maybe the, the son or daughter of somebody who was African born. Names that also are really indicative that a person either is currently enslaved or perhaps spent part of their life enslaved and has since become free are names that actually sound a little bit Roman. 
So Scipio is one that you come across. Um, you can see people who are named Caesar or Pompey fairly often. Pompey and Caesar were actually enemies, but they, we in Wilton have somebody who was named Pompey Caesar all in one. Dr. Hughes noted that even after slavery had ended, many formerly enslaved people were difficult to track as they moved around trying to build a new life from nothing. So very different opportunities for blacks depending on which town they happen to be living in. And you get a sense that black families, black individuals were really trying to sort out where they had the best opportunities. Uh, and you see a lot of mobility. So you'll see one family where once you get a census that indicates where people were born, sometimes you'll have a census taker who's very specific and he'll say not just Connecticut, but which specific town in Connecticut. So I've seen examples where there's a single family, dad was maybe born in New York, mom maybe was born in Virginia, and then every single child was born in a different Connecticut town. So this track of movement between different places, following jobs, following opportunities, trying to find something better because the situation they were in had so few advantages, it didn't appeal, it wasn't good. So what was the impediment to moving on? There was only hope and they kept moving and kept trying. And that's what these different, you know, children born in each different town leaves trace of these attempts to improve your life and to take control. In spite of the difficulties, Dr. Hughes realized how vital it was to bring the forgotten lives of those who helped build the town back to the forefront. Have a lot of patience and do not give up. Persevere, keep looking, look at every single piece of paper. It may take a very long time, but if you've got the land records and the index says that there's not a single black person in there, do not trust it. Look at every single page, just scan through it, search for keywords, uh, search for you know certain names, uh, certain trends in the names, and be very thorough and spend a lot of time at it. Uh, and if you can't do it all on your own, recruit help. As we continue to learn more about the lives of Wilton's enslaved residents and their descendants, their impact on our history cannot be ignored. It is an undeniable fact that enslaved African people helped build and develop Wilton alongside those familiar European names we recognize. Local success stories and wealth building for the settlers were enabled by social and economic structures that were unyielding and unequal in ways both subtle and obvious. Their effects continue to the present. We are reminded of these inequities every day even if we do not realize it. There is no Tonquin Street in Wilton, no Henry Dulliman School, no Cato Cannon Community Center. The familiar names of the colonial founders of Wilton can be seen throughout this town's historic cemeteries. The final resting place of many of the enslaved of Wilton is a place known in the historical record as Spruce Bank. Whatever marked these burials have long since disappeared and its actual location has been lost to history.